The more than 80 years of Walt Disney Animation Studios can be divided into roughly seven eras that define the many changes experienced by the genre-defining studio. There's the Golden Era, spanning from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in 1937 to Bambi in 1942, the Wartime Era and its minor films from 1942 through 1949, the Silver Age, extending from Cinderella in 1950 through The Jungle Book in 1967, the Bronze Age, which spanned from the Aristocats in 1970 until Oliver and Company in 1988, the Disney Renaissance, marked by The Little Mermaid in 1989 and Tarzan in 1999, the post-Renaissance era, bordered by Fantasia 2000 and Bolt in 2008, and the modern era, sometimes known as the Revival, which began with The Princess and the Frog in 2009 and spans until today. However, while these eras can provide some insights into the ever-shifting nature of the creative process within Disney animation, it is in the Silver Age where we find the culmination of classic Disney and the irrevocable changes that followed. This apex is found in 1959's Sleeping Beauty, a gorgeously rendered fairy tale whose painstaking creative process built upon everything that Walt Disney and company had crafted in the two decades prior. The massive amounts of work needed to create it and the disappointing reception it received upon release forced the studio to change their creative process immediately afterward, and these reverberations can be seen in the decades that followed. Sleeping Beauty is a loose adaptation of Charles Perrault's fantasy tale of the same name and tells the story of Princess Aurora, born to King Stephen and Queen Leah, and the recipient of a curse from the wicked Maleficent, who destines the baby to prick her finger on the needle of a spinning wheel on her 16th birthday and die. The curse causes the kingdom to hide the child, having her live with three fairy godmothers and unaware of both her true identity and her betrothal to Prince Philip, whose marriage will unite the kingdoms. Of course, destiny brings the two star-crossed lovers together and pushes Aurora toward her fate, which both Philip and the fairy godmothers fight to prevent. While that narrative structure may adhere to the many tried and true elements of classic fairy tales, it's the quality of animation and astounding visual aesthetics which makes Sleeping Beauty such an unforgettable piece of Disney history. The path from the early inception of the story in 1951 to Sleeping Beauty's eventual release on January 29, 1959 is a long and arduous one, filled with script rewrites, director changes, and multiple shifts in artistic direction. Spearheaded by Walt Disney in the last animated film that would be largely influenced by the studio founder, the fairy tale was shaped by three supervising directors. Wilfred Jackson, who left the project due to a heart attack, Eric Larson, who started as a sequence director in charge of Aurora's forest dance with Prince Philip, and finally Clyde Geronimi, who saw the film to completion after Larson's dismissal. This is in addition to sequence directors Wolfgang Reitherman, who oversaw the dragon battle finale, and Les Clark, in charge of the opening sequence of Baby Princess Aurora's presentation. Beyond these animation heads, Sleeping Beauty also had seven contributing writers and five directing animators. It's a process that was shepherded and often complicated by Walt Disney's involvement, leading to the many changes in leadership and shifting story elements. However, those many changes were in pursuit of a singular vision, the culmination of the many animated features created in the years prior. In addition, the film is presented in anamorphic widescreen, the second ever for Disney following 1955's Lady and the Tramp, with Sleeping Beauty presented in Super Technorama 70mm prints which took animation filmed in 35mm Technorama and optically unsqueezed and enlarged the film to 70mm for an aspect ratio of 2.55 to 1. Consider the stark contrast of Sleeping Beauty and Lady and the Tramp when compared to every Disney film which came before and the two decades of film that came after, which were all presented in the 1.35 to 1 Academy ratio. And you can see how these two stories, and especially Sleeping Beauty, feel like exceptional achievements within the history of animation. Due to the massive budget of Sleeping Beauty, it wouldn't be until the ill-fated Black Cauldron in 1985 that Disney would return to Super Technorama, settling on standard widescreen presentation from then on. The result of Sleeping Beauty's presentation is an expansively widescreen framing that encapsulates both character and audience in a fantasy world that allows foreground, background, and action to be showcased at every second. We can see the specific advantages of the ratio in Aurora and Philip's forest dance, where the Disney team has the couple gracefully waltz along in a still frame. This allows audiences to capture their intricate movements, their stunning reflections in the water, 
and the delicate framing created by the forest around them without cutting to these individual elements. Likewise, the massive halls within the castle at the film's start and the enormous forest of thorns that plays as the setting for the film's climactic showdown are allowed to be expansive, feeling like living and breathing worlds instead of incidental background. The result is a fantasy setting that is just as important and iconic as the characters that live in it. This world is complemented by composer George Brun's adaptation of Tchaikovsky's Sleeping Beauty Ballet, a gorgeous and stately score punctuated by the enchanting Once Upon a Dream and its two reprises throughout the story. These decisions show Sleeping Beauty to not be the result of sudden inspiration and experimentation, but rather as the culmination of many years of growth and experience within the studio. While Walt Disney was also busy in both television and the development of Disneyland at the time of the creation of the film, it's clear from the experiences relayed by the many involved with the film's development that the studio head was heavily invested in Sleeping Beauty's formation. The entire film feels crafted to showcase and meditate on this gorgeous art, largely avoiding the comedic subplots of most Disney films both before and after in an effort to stay focused on the main narrative at hand. It's perhaps why Sleeping Beauty is one of the most serious-minded yet slowest Disney films of the studio's early decades. And while the process of creating an animated film is ultimately a collaborative one that takes elements from the styles of numerous artists, the source of the iconic look and feel of Sleeping Beauty can be found in acclaimed background artist Ivan Earl. The art style of Sleeping Beauty finds its roots in the unicorn tapestries a series of seven pieces of medieval art housed at the Met Cloisters, which were brought to the attention of Walt Disney by story artist John Hench and given initial life in the sketches of Kay Nielsen. Ivan Earl built off these ideas in the following years and infused the art with a Renaissance style, taking an extremely detailed approach to the world, which can be seen in the bark of forest trees, divots of castle wall stones, and hanging drapes that add a softness to this fantasy world. Walt was committed to Earl's modernist interpretation of medieval settings, instructing all artists involved in the creation of the film to match his approach in their character designs and color choices. In particular, character animator Mark Davis found inspiration in Earl's style when he created the models for Aurora and Maleficent, bringing characters to life that embodied the formalist designs of the world around them. However, the difficulties that came from Earl's designs not only led to an incredibly slow creative process, but caused numerous fights behind the scenes. Earl and Geronimi clashed over their conflicting approaches to animation, and when Earl left the studio in 1958, the supervising director softened his background art to fit a more classic Disney style. But for all these details, the world of Sleeping Beauty is dynamically explored with a motivated camera consistently moving through and searching about its many locations. Whereas the opening storybook pages of the film showcase a simplistic, flattened style that is more highly evocative of early Renaissance art, the film animation quickly establishes a large depth of field. Both foreground and backgrounds shift within the frame, contrasting the movements of characters with a vast surrounding geography. This world is gorgeously lit with shifting lighting sources, including soft dusks, roaring infernos, and the demonic glow of Maleficent herself. <laughs> that meticulous and seamless blend of static background with moving animation cells avoids the obvious mismatch of cell and frame that often comes with lower budget animation. Earl's blend of modernist style and medieval setting literally built the look of Sleeping Beauty from the ground up with Disney insisting that his character animators compose their subjects in a manner that suited the world they inhabited. It's a far more formal and mannered approach to character animation than what can be seen in the malleable and highly expressive designs seen in the films before and after. Even characters as heightened as the fairy godmothers are typically set within the boundaries of real human movement. In conjunction with these animation rules, Disney insisted on filming live-action references for his animators. And while Helene Stanley had previously acted as a character model for Cinderella before modeling for Aurora, the matching of animation to real life was far more extensive in Sleeping Beauty. Actors were chosen and performed every scene in the film in costume, with Disney insisting on creating models that were as grounded in flesh and blood as possible. The result is a consistency between both characters and world that creates a cohesive experience designed to irrevocably tie these two elements together, rather than contrasting them. 
as can be seen in some styles of animation that seek to highlight the cartoonish nature of their narratives. During the cell animation process, Disney's scores of cleanup artists would first paint the outlines and details of each character, allowing the paint to dry before flipping it over and coloring in the characters from the opposite side of the cell. The result is an incredibly rich and robust animation for each figure. The details can be seen in the vibrancy of the color and gorgeous animation of movement on the screen. Aurora's hair in particular highlights the painstaking animation process, with each curl moving and bouncing along with her actions. The two-tone details created by a hue difference between line work and fill-in colors making it incredibly eye-catching. Perhaps it's this consistency within a more grounded approach that makes the detailed animation of Sleeping Beauty so impressive, as every element created by the animation team is on full display within a believable world. It's also the reason behind the unforgettable terror of Maleficent. Now shall you deal with me, O oh Prince, and all the powers of hell! Her lurking evil and eventual deadly transformation colors and corrupts the world around her without altering the reality of the locations. The bright and comforting colors of the first two acts give way to sickly darkness and unnatural fire, impressing a danger upon both hero and audience that, when overcome, gives way to restoration and happiness. The result of the blood, sweat, and tears poured into the making of Sleeping Beauty? The film was a box office disappointment, only making $5.3 million in its initial run against a $6 million budget. Critically, the film was met with solid if unenthusiastic reviews, with most praise going toward the animation. It was a result that hit Walt Disney hard, with the creator briefly considering putting an end to the studio's animated output due to how expensive it had become and considerable layoffs impacting the team behind the film. It was the end of an era. Nevertheless, Sleeping Beauty steadily gained prominence within the genre, eventually becoming heralded as a classic piece of animation. Its influence on the style and themes of countless films, both within Disney Studios and in the works of many other creators, is evidence of the film's timeless impact. Through re-releases and critical reappraisal, Sleeping Beauty now stands as an emblem of Disney animation, its iconic images inextricable from the early years of the studio. However, the immediate impact of Sleeping Beauty's rough road to release and disappointing reception necessitated a major shift in the world of Walt Disney Studios. It was a massive change that came upon the arrival of the next theatrical animated feature, and one that would shape the style of Disney for the many decades that followed. <laughs>